In the early part of the 20th century, woodblocks were embraced in China for two significant reasons. First, for their long tradition in Chinese art. It was essentially a Chinese form. Woodblock printing in China had reached maturity by the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907 CE. But possibly even more relevant to the times, there was a renewed interest for the print medium's potential to promote social change. Unlike traditional Chinese prints, and in place of religious texts and folktales, left-wing artists used printing to shout in protest. In 1929, activist Liu Xuan published the first issue of the Morning Flower Society. The journal introduced foreign literature and art to Chinese audiences. Two of these volumes were dedicated to modern woodcuts. Xuan believed print was the most accessible and efficient way to spread new revolutionary thought to the masses. He wrote, I quote, In revolutionary times, woodblock is used most extensively. It can be produced immediately. They were called the new woodcut artists. Their tools were knives, and they used them to carve and hewn blocks of wood. Lu Xun wrote of them, I quote, Printmakers as artists do not imitate, do not replicate. The author holds the knife towards the wood and cuts straight away. He praised the rough and organized power of the aesthetic. When Japan invaded China in 1931, Jiang Feng printed flyers and posted them in the streets. It illustrates the armed Japanese forces that marched into a village in Shenyang. The flyers were in protest to both the Japanese attack and the non-resistant policy of the Chinese government. Inspired by modern European woodcuts, especially the art of German expressionist Katie Kulvich, this aggressive aesthetic emphasizes the bold black cut marks on the printed page, much different from the decorative and meticulous line work of traditional Chinese woodcuts. In the years that followed, Communist activist artists organized collective woodcut workshops to spread their visual messages throughout the country to the illiterate masses. Messages that called for resistance and publicized brutality. The Chinese Communist Party grew more powerful, and Mao Zedong rose to leadership. In May 1942, Mao delivered a famous speech at the Yan'an Conference on Literature and Art, where he argued Literature and art are subordinate to politics, but in their turn exert a great influence on politics. Mao declared, art should serve the masses of revolutionary workers, peasants, and soldiers. Posters made during the Cultural Revolution are bold and forceful, and the larger-than-life figures displayed heroic gestures of fervent expressions. Many of these messages showed tiny figures being crushed by the heroic proletariat. The predominant color of new artworks was red, the color of revolution. As the messenger, government-controlled formulaic propaganda shifted from prints depicting poverty and suffering to woodcuts which celebrated the bright new life supposedly being lived in areas under communist control. Yan'an woodcut merged with Soviet-influenced social realism, which would dominate Chinese art exclusively in the following decades reaching its peak during the Cultural Revolution. The style changed from strong, aggressive black and white to a more refined line and dramatic light and shadow on the figure's face. The woodcut used for resistance was now a state-controlled instrument for the manipulation and oppression of the people. During every phase of the Cultural Revolution, pictorial posters played a crucial role in communicating the frequent changes of official policy and its interpretation. These are stated in the titles and slogans on the posters. In the initial phase, the emphasis was on attacking revisionism. We see this with the tiny figures being crushed by the righteous fists of the proletariat, and with the cult of a godlike chairman Mao Zedong becoming increasingly prominent. The theme at this point in the Cultural Revolution was a cult of Mao as it is often referred to. Long live Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong, thought, is what this poster reads.
The portraits of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin appear next to Mao in this widely recognized and often imitated poster from the early Cultural Revolution. Woodcuts have been adopted by reformers across continents and across centuries to express resistance to institutional power. These became in China the means of totalitarian indoctrination. Mao becomes more godlike as his head is often depicted looming over his loyal subjects. One object that is ubiquitous in the posters is the little red book of quotations from Mao's writings, where it appears as an essential accessory to be clutched to the chest or waved aloft. After the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, the academic mode known as social realism became the dominant style of, of propagandistic art following the example of the Soviet Union. During China's Cultural Revolution, traditional artists were condemned as counter-revolutionaries and imprisoned. In their place, the government attempted to create a new visual culture, one that celebrated workers, soldiers, industrial progress, and Chairman Mao. Posters made during the Cultural Revolution are bold and forceful, and the larger-than-life figures displayed heroic gestures the visual artist, Wang Guangyi, appropriates this language in his contemporary works, the Great Criticism series. Guangyi is taking on the loyal capitalist consumer economy that is so prevalent today. Dao Zibao are one of the most powerful symbols of the Cultural Revolution. These big character posters are political instruments first, and aesthetic artifacts secondly an object which is both material and textural. Dao Zibao were a type of political writing, handwritten and posted in public spaces. It was a grassroots graphic form of rebellion. Dao Zibao, in Mao's words, were a useful new weapon for the masses. They were a political discourse for the Cultural Revolution. These posters were not produced on the valuable rice paper used for printmaking and painting but rather these were written on ordinary packing paper manufactured all over China, and tens of thousands of Dazibao were produced in a single month. The first big character posters were produced by students in June of 1966, and in its height of production, more than 50,000 big character posters were created each month. As most printed material, the Dazibao were meant to be ephemeral. The Dazibao became essential postings to keep the people informed on the continuously shifting ideological climate of the chaotic revolution. They were hung so high that much of the Dazibao were impossible for the crowd to read. In a sense, they became a spectacle, as this was a political statement of oppression in itself. These big character posters were calling people out for being counter-revolutionary. The rhetoric called on people to come and look, but rarely to think a very optical and visual message. These words intended for public consumption were almost always vilifying and angry words. Humiliation and scrutiny used to keep a people in line and coerce the people to be angry. This idea of being accosted with words is a contemporary experience with advertising. So advertising has much in common this way with the Dazi Bao. Huey Newton and fellow student Bobby Seale, pictured on the left, formed the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in 1966. Taking on a militant stance, coupled with the burgeoning pride associated with the Black Power movement, the Black Panther Party became infamous for brandishing guns, challenging the authority of police officers, and embracing a concept Newton named revolutionary humanism. Its initial purpose was to patrol black neighborhoods to protect residents from the police. This 1967 poster of Huey Newton, Black Panther's Party Minister of Defense, was one of the most iconic images of the mid-1960s. It was a posed photograph produced for a second issue of the Black Panther Party newspaper and made the visual connection between historic African symbols of tribal defense and modern weapons for community self-determination. The powerful copy on the bottom of the poster, written by Huey Newton himself, 
reads, the racist dog policemen must withdraw immediately from our communities, cease their wanton murder and brutality and torture of black people, or face the wrath of the armed people. The poster is a black and white photo of Huey Newton seated on a wicker chair holding a rifle in one hand and a spear in the other, flanked by hide shields on a zebra skin rug. The photography is attributed to Blair Stapp. 22-year-old Emery Douglas went from the Black Arts Movement in Oakland, California to the Black Panthers. Douglas drew on his experience in City College and offered to help with the design and production of the publication. He was named first revolutionary artist and then minister of culture. He had 100% graphic freedom in the design of the publications. If you look in the upper right, this is a screenshot of his Zoom presentation through Letterform Archives on August 27, 2020, as he discusses his process and the work that he created. Hot off the press, these Black Panther publications, they started as woodcuts, but then he emulated a woodcut with markers and rubdown patterns and textures for more speed and efficiency of production. He had design control starting with the second publication, called the Mayday Paper. The production of the publication was a portable operation, as he described it. They could bring all their production materials and cut, collage, design, and assemble right on the floor with a portable workboard. They started by working out of Eldridge's apartment. A lot of the text was typed on a ball typewriter. Douglas selected typefaces based on what they had, an economy of means. He used Format, which is a brand name for a sheet of type. It was a cheaper version than the rubdown letter set, if you're familiar with that. According to FBI files on Douglas, the FBI knew the second color of every publication, and they were actually allowed to read the newspapers as they were coming off the press. At its height, there were 100,000 papers in circulation, and they were read at least four times for a readership of 400,000. They discussed together that the idea was you had to write like a child could understand the message. And so Douglas adopted this concept and believed you had to draw the way a child would understand the art. Another layer of communication was the buttons that he put on the people in some of the illustrations. This image of a hand controlling President Ford represented the mega corporations, the oligarchs, controlling the nation. On the right is a cartoon of an Olympic gold medalist, first taking victory, then racially profiled. A powerful graphic statement put out by the Black Panthers. No matter how great your accomplishments, they still only judge you by your skin. Douglas would interpret and reflect in the art the sentiment of the conversations. A pig was illustrated as a beast that has no regard for life. It evolved and became a sign for U.S. imperialism and fascism. Other symbols included the vulture, overheard in conversations by the phrase blood-sucking vultures, and the rat was a symbol for the abolitionist businessman, or it was a symbol to bring attention to the poor living conditions in the black communities. In 1968, the Black Panther Party collaborated with an organization I'll talk about later in this lecture out of Cuba. On the left, this anti-U.S. imperialism solidarity poster was created in Cuba and contained four different languages. They remixed some of Douglas's illustrations that you see on the right after Bobby Seals agreed to work with the group. Standing in solidarity, the newspaper on the right reads, Black people can destroy the machinery that's enslaving the world. America cannot stand and fight every Black country in the world and fight a civil war at the same time. It is militarily impossible to do both of these at once. This is a screen print the Cuban organization produced, inspired by Douglas's color palette and illustration on the right. The 10-point platform for the Black Panthers was the guiding argument, and it reads like it was written for today, a rallying cry for the quality of life in the Black community, decent housing, quality education, the end of police brutality against the Black community, this became their main cause. In January 1969, St. Augustine's Church served as the site for the Black Panther Party's first ever free breakfast program. In fact, it was the first free breakfast program in the nation. 
The program started as a modest event and quickly grew, feeding thousands of hungry children within a few weeks of its launch. This program continues to be the basis of the current school breakfast programs across the country today. An inspiring artist collective out of Chicago formed in 1968. The five founding members of Afro Cobra created an aesthetic philosophy to guide their collective work. A shared visual language for positive revolutionary ideas. The founding members, Jeff Donaldson, Wadsworth Gerald, Jay Gerald, Barbara Jones Hogu, and Gerald Williams, several of whom worked together on the Wall of Respect, a mural at 43rd Street and Langley in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood. Early exhibitions and meetings were held in nearby Woodlawn. The group defined its mission as an approach to image making which would reflect and project the moods, attitudes, and sensibilities of African Americans independent of the technical and aesthetic strictures of Eurocentric modalities. In the 60s, civil unrest spread throughout much of Europe and the United States. But France was different. France experienced a revolt. The country's economy came to a halt and even led its president, Charles de Gaulle, to flee the country. And it all started with students. At the beginning of the revolt, university students, teachers, artists, intellectuals, and government employees joined forces to make France a more equal and just country. As you might expect, the École des Beaux-Arts, the School of Fine Arts, was at the heart of the uprising. It was occupied and turned into a grand artist's workshop where they made posters to rally the people to their cause. Those posters must have been compelling because soon millions of French workers were on strike. Economic life in France virtually stopped. Workers from the Nanterre Citroën car factory take part in the demonstration at the end of May 1968. The goals of the workers were certainly different from the students and intellectuals, emphasizing better pay and working conditions. What they saw was an opportunity to achieve what they wanted amid the chaos. Students dug up Paris cobblestone streets and turned the stones into missiles. The police used tear gas and batons to fight back. The students used thousands of copies of posters they made to every empty surface they could find. It was a crude and effective way to spread news of the revolt. This must have been the only revolution where students actually joined together with factory workers. It was a loose confederation, but a real one at the time. This translates as the union of workers and students, affirming their solidarity. This may have been one of the most famous posters of the Revolution. A member of the French riot police is depicted as a member of the SS, the Nazi Special Police. The poster on the right reads unlimited strikes. Three figures walk arm in arm, representing the students, union members, and factory workers and their unity. The words on the bottle of poison read, press, do not swallow. Much of the media was government-owned and reported only the government's point of view. The raised fist is a straightforward call to march and to fight for the causes of students and workers. It remains a well-known symbol of solidarity on the left. You see it today with Black Lives Matter. And finally, the police officers raided the École des Beaux-Arts and expelled the students. In this poster, a helmeted officer, complete with wolf-sharp teeth, grips a paintbrush in his mouth, a symbol of the police takeover of the school. The poster reads, the police show up at the Beaux-Arts, the Beaux-Arts displays in the street. The poster on the right shows the silhouette of Charles de Gaulle, the French president at the time, covering the mouth of a young man. It reads, be young and shut up. The expression was also a pun on a popular French film in 1958, titled Be Beautiful But Shut Up. A sketch of Daniel Cohn Binday, a French-German student leader during the uprising, is seen in the poster on the left. He was known as Danny the Red because of his flaming red hair and the fact that he was a communist. The headline in the poster translates, We Are All Undesirables. It refers to Cohn Binday's expulsion from France during the protests when he was deemed an undesirable. 
In the poster on the right, the factory chimney completes the last letter of the word we, or yes, above the words occupied factories. It was designed to encourage workers to take over more factories. Auto manufacturers Renault and Citroën and the aeronautics firm Sud Aviation and Dassault had already been deeply hurt by the strikes. In response to the protests, President de Gaulle was famously reported to have said, Reform yes, havoc no. The poster on the left reads, Once again, he is the havoc. Though he was hero and a symbol of the resistance against Germany in World War II, he was deeply unsympathetic to the strikers and hated by them. This classic poster on the right of May 68 depicts unity between French and immigrant workers. As background information, France had recruited many workers from Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia to help build railroads and other infrastructures. A short man is a symbol of a factory owner, trying to push them apart. The slogan reads, Workers United. This image shows the protest posters from the uprising in a Paris exhibition titled Clash of Images. The strikes that began in May 1968 became the paradigm for social protest in France even today. And although the emotions have lessened, the ideas still resonate. In 1970, three young designers founded a collective design studio in France. In those days, left-wing radicals were called Stalinist scum. They took the derogatory name, combined it with the word graphic, and ended up with the name of their studio. Grappus. They were all members of the French Communist Party, and they designed toward political, social, and cultural rather than commercial ends. The Grappus poster on the left reads, No Neutrons, Mr. Reagan. It was a visual response to an international controversy about nuclear missiles in Europe in 1981. The type became buttons, bumper stickers, handouts, street posters, and became a rallying cry for the whole world. Africa becomes a skull in this anti-apartheid poster on the right. This theater poster for a play titled after a popular champagne became more than just a promotion. It was an interesting social comment on the iconic brand of soft drink with a baby bottle nipple attached to its spout. Grappus manipulated cultural and commercial icons to reinvent their meanings. On the right is a 1982 Grappus exhibition poster titled Adolf Mouse, combining and defacing the ubiquitous yellow smiley face with Mickey Mouse ears, Hitler's hair and mustache, and they used the communist hammer and sickle for one eye and the French tricolor symbol for the other. These contradictions created unsettling emotions and radical anti-corporate statements. Everything the collective designed was considered a grappus design, in keeping with the communist collective ideals. For 20 years, they inspired design students all over the world until they disbanded in early 1991. From the end of World War II until the dismantling of the Iron Curtain in 1989, the industrialized nations formed two groups the capitalist democracies of Western Europe, North America, and Japan, and the communist bloc led by the Soviet Union. The emerging nations of Latin America, Asia, and Africa were developing nations. I'm going to talk about two organizations operating in Cuba at the time. One organization is CORE, Comisión de Orientación Revolucionaria, which stands for the Commission for Revolutionary Action or Orientation. This internal group created propaganda primarily by promoting commemorative days and past leaders, thus maintaining awareness of the revolution. Posters became vehicles to challenge authority, express dissent, and demonstrate solidarity with the oppressed people of the world. These oppositional posters carry political messages operating outside of traditional government and corporate censorship. In social and political struggles, ideas become weapons, and those ideas are spread through the major vehicle of print. In the case of Cuba, Fidel Castro and the communist-led government supported internal messages. Newspapers often printed a poster on the first or last page so that people could put it up on the wall. In this way, a revolutionary form of visual art helped to raise social awareness. 
The 1970 poster on the left depicts leaders and workers of the Socialist Party in Cuba. The poster on the right was created to remind people of the commemorative day when the Cuban Revolution was launched. The bright colors become the focal point and stand out in the drab, overpopulated urban slum. Torn paper reveals the sun to represent dawn shining through the darkness. It was a metaphor for the light of Fidel Castro's revolutionaries overthrowing the darkness of a corrupt Batista government. But Castro also supported governments outside of Cuba, and this medium of the poster was so effective against oppression. The other organization, working out of Havana, created propagandistic messages to spread outside of Cuba in solidarity with other countries. The art posters were produced for Castro's Organization of Solidarity for the People of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, OSPOL, which was born out of the Tricontinental Conference hosted in Havana in 1966 to combat U.S. imperialism. On the left is titled Week of Solidarity with the Peoples of Africa from 1973. Typography creates an arrow or spear that breaks through the photographic barbed wire. Sign is married with photo, and dimensional typography combines with three-dimensional image. On the right is Day of Solidarity with the people of Guinea-Bissau and the island of Cape Verde, 1974. The nation's flag is the backdrop for the symbolic broken chain. Through the device of a drop shadow, two powerful graphics become one. The 1971 illustration on the left is depicting a figure of the United States draining oil reserves from the continent of Africa and spitting out dollar signs. It is a harsh visual statement of American control and corporate greed. On the right is the Week of Solidarity with Vietnam from 1968. Crushed between the two lines of type is the symbol of American government. Uncle Sam's hat divides the type Vietnam. America is crushed between the North and the South. In the poster on the left, Elena Serrano creates Day of the Heroic Guerrilla, 1968. The icon Che Guevara transforms into a map of South America. Serrano centered Guevara's portrait on the country of Bolivia at the heart of South America, where Guevara was ultimately gunned down. His image radiates across the whole continent and beyond. The international message, Day of the Heroic Guerrilla, in the top right corner of the poster, was printed in four languages, Spanish, French, English, and Arabic. Guevara was one of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution who went off to fight in Bolivia. He has been transformed into an iconic symbol representing the struggle against oppression. His image is one of the most reproduced of the late 20th century, changing an ordinary man into a mythological hero. In the poster on the right, his image appears on a graphic vest woven into the tapestry, representing a vest of protection suspended by a rifle in the negative space. Walk through any of the world's major cities, and it is likely you will catch at least a glimpse somewhere of the iconic portrait of Dr. Ernesto Che Guevara. Whether printed on a passing t-shirt, stenciled on a brick wall, or parodied on the cover of a magazine or poster, Guevara's concentrated faraway gaze stares out with a force of recognition that is almost unique in the history of portraiture. This man turned myth has come to stand for many ideas over time. It is now a symbol of rebellion. Graphic design mixed with revolution provides us with a language in which beauty and revolution are interwoven. Design has the power to topple regimes and to move mountains when those mountains are mere men. The Guerrilla Girls formed in 1985 as an anonymously operating group of New York artists who became known for using guerrilla masks. The group members used the names of dead female artists like Frida Kahlo, Eva Hess, Katie Kolvich, Gertrude Stein, Georgia O'Keeffe, to name a few. It is not known who the members are in real life and how many belong to the group. And you can see from this photo that they are planning to we pace the city with their powerful messages of protest. 
they began a poster campaign that targeted museums, dealers, curators, critics, and artists who they felt were actively responsible for or complicit in the exclusion of women and non-white artists from mainstream exhibitions and publications. This one reads, Gorilla Girl's Definition of a Hypocrite, an art collector who buys white male art at benefits for liberal causes, but never buys art by women or artists of color. This poster uses irony to drive home the message of exclusion and invisibility, the advantages of being a woman artist, working without the pressure of success, not having to be in shows with men, having an escape from the art world in your four freelance jobs, knowing your career might pick up after you're 80, being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine, not being stuck in a tenured teaching position, seeing your ideas live on in the artwork of others, having the opportunity to choose between career and motherhood, not having to choke on those big cigars or paint in Italian suits, having more time to work after your mate dumps you for someone younger, being included in revised versions of art history, not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius, getting your picture in the art magazines wearing a gorilla suit. In addition to their poster campaign, they create other ephemera like postcards and bumper stickers. They produce billboards and even make public appearances, especially at art openings. The message in the left poster highlights the economic discrimination in art sales and the art market. And on the right is a look at an exhibition that was at the Tate Modern in London. Their actual graphic design is on display as art. This is a classic Gorilla Girl sticker. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. In addition to sexism, they take on racism and corruption in politics, art, film, and pop culture. Gorilla Girls calls out New York art galleries for a lack of representation of women artists that spans decades. These numbers illustrate the complacency in the art market, where very little has changed since the mid-80s. Many of the galleries from the 1985 list remain in 2014, and the percentage has only gone up 10%. Gorilla Girls has posted anti-film industry billboards in Hollywood, just in time for the Oscars. It reads, The anatomically correct Oscar. He's white and male, just like the guys who win. This billboard reads, Even the U.S. Senate is more progressive than Hollywood. Tokenism is just one of the concerns challenged by the group. This 1986 report card of the New York galleries inspires Pussy Galore, an international feminist art collective of artists, curators, critics, collectors, educators, and writers. Pussy Galore is dedicated to eradicating sexism in the art world. The collective takes up the Gorilla Girls baton in 2015. The revised tally exposes sexism is alive and well at 34 New York City art galleries 29 years later. Note that the typeface and layout mirror the 1986 poster. Crystal clarity through design choices that these two activist groups share a common aim.